Welcome to Tom Manitas Jobs. My name is Tom Manitas. Uh, thanks for tuning in to our session about finding a job on Capitol Hill. Uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, two Capitol Hill veterans from both sides of the aisle to talk to you today about you know, how they got to Capitol Hill, some tips that they found um, when they were working on the Hill that they can share with you. So whether you're somebody who's in school thinking about working on Capitol Hill, uh, whether you're trying to get your first start on Capitol Hill right now, or whether you're on Capitol Hill um, and trying to figure out how to excel, we've got two great experts to talk to you today. But little, first, a little bit about Tom Anatos Jobs. Um, we started this service because I, when I started on Capitol Hill, find my, found myself in a privileged situation being in a leadership office. And I was on all these different email lists, and this is before Twitter and Facebook and all this stuff and LinkedIn. And uh, I found these jobs coming through and I started forwarding them to folks that I knew who are looking to get a job on Capitol Hill. And it became this big thing on Capitol Hill saying, oh, you got to get on Tom Manitas' email list. He'll, he'll send you the jobs. Uh, so it became this thing. And then um, I met somebody from the opposite party, fell in love with her and married her, and she convinced me to make it a bipartisan thing. So what we do today is we simply try to get as many jobs that we can get our hands on, whether it be on Capitol Hill and campaigns or the nonprofit private sector that has anything to do with politics or policy and get it out to the world. Um, and while our, our service is important, the most important thing about finding a job on Capitol Hill is networking and figuring out the tips and tricks uh, which we're going to bring to you today. So instead of um, butchering their resumes and, and the wonderful things they've done, I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves. Um, like I was saying earlier, they're, they're two uh, highly accomplished individuals who have spent some time on Capitol Hill and I think are going to give you some great advice today. So I'm going to turn it over to Keenan to introduce herself and then Reginald can introduce himself. So Keenan, you want to you go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Tom. And um, I've, I've been a benefactor of Tom Manitas Bliss, so I, um, I totally endorse it and think that you should subscribe to his list if you are uh, seeking a job on the Hill. That's, that's one pro tip straight out the gate. So I'm originally from Atlanta, went to college at Florida a University. I got my undergrad and MBA. So bottom line, I did not plan a career in politics. Um, my first job was in the private sector. I was a buyer, a men's neckwear buyer at Macy's for about five minutes, really a year. And then I went on to be um, a pharmaceutical sales rep for five years. During that time, I met who would be my first congressional boss, Frederica Wilson, at a fundraiser and um, met her campaign manager, started volunteering uh, with the campaign and the whole thing got out of hand. They asked me to tweet and then they asked me to staff her and then drive her. And it just, all of a sudden I was the top campaign staffer. I got a three-way call with her and the campaign manager asking me to leave the campaign. The campaign manager was sick and she needed me to take over. And all they said was, can you step up? And so I never run, ran a congressional race, but I stepped up, I did it. We beat eight people and she brought me with her to Washington. Um, I started off as her senior advisor and went on to be her deputy chief of staff, which meant I had a policy portfolio, portfolio and then also in my own free time, not using house resources, did some fundraising for her back home in Miami. And that was a great run. I learned how to do everything that you could do in a congressional office. I left there and I was a chief of staff to a DC council member, which has a very um, house-like setup. And then from there, I was political director for Hillary Clinton in Florida. And that I was the face of the campaign to every elected official from your very local uh, mem members of the council to our US senators at the time and managed a team who communicated messaging on behalf of the campaign. Following that race, that brought me back to DC where I was chief of staff to Congressman Donald McEachin, who was a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. I managed his team in all of the district offices and now I am a vice president at the Alpine Group, uh, servicing clients who um, are in energy tech and healthcare. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Tom. That's great, Reginald. Wow, Keenan, I, I I probably should have gone first because <laughs> it's extremely impressive. Yeah, uh, I feel inadequate too. I'm with you. Jeez. <laughs> are you sure you want me to be on this, Tom? <laughs> uh, but no, Keenan, that's great. So just give you guys a quick little rundown about my background. I'm originally from Austin, Texas, born and raised. Um, Reginald Darby, of course. 
um, moved to DC, ended up going to Howard University where I studied political science and uh, public policy. Um, and during my time at Howard, the, the way I really got involved was um, I was vice chair of the College Republicans. Um, wasn't the easiest thing to do at a HBCU, um, but it was definitely interesting and someone had to do it. So I was willing to step up into that role. Um, and in that role, it kind of got me more involved with the RNC. Um, and actually the, the year that I got involved was the year of President Obama's very first run in 2008. And um, I was the, the black guy on campus who was campaigning for John McCain and Sarah Palin. And as you can imagine, that was never um, the, the nicest or the most um, imaginable thing that you would want to do on a HBCU campus, but it was all good. Um, I was able to get my very first internship on the Hill while still being a full-time student, starting off at the GOP conference under the chairmanship of Adam Putnam. Um, was super cool. I got to learn from so many like wise and smart individuals on the Hill. Um, my, one of my very first bosses, her name um, is Emily Seidel. She is now the president and CEO of um, it just completely eluded me, but it's a Koch Brothers organization, America's for Prosperity, sorry. Um, so I always go back to thinking, what would Emily do in this moment? Um, and it definitely guided me throughout my career on the Hill. Uh, from there, I left um, the conference because I was still a student and they were paying me a, a stipend at the time. And um, the new chairman came in because Mr. Putnam decided to go to Florida and become the co uh, commissioner of agriculture. And um, Mike Pence came in as the new chair. And when um, now vice president, former vice president Mike Pence, um, when he came in, he took away that stipend. And when you take away that stipend, um, took away my livelihood to be great on the Hill and also to be a great student. So I um, began to apply. And this is when the new Congress was coming in um, in 2009. And I applied for a position in Congressman Joseph Gow's office from New Orleans, who had just beat William Jefferson in a special election. Um, and I applied for the position and I was hired on as a staff assistant and legislative aide. So I stayed there for a year and I, I, I was ready to do something else, but I didn't know exactly what it was. So I left the Hill for a while and came back um, a few years later to where I became the um, senior legislative assistant to Congressman Allen West from Florida. Um, absolutely loved working for Mr. West. It was a great opportunity. Um, he definitely lended himself as a freshman member to his staff. Um, so that was absolutely amazing. And he was a Floridian um, by way of Georgia, of course. But then from there, um, I went on to uh, leave the Hill and work at the National Association of Health Underwriters as their Director of Federal Affairs. Um, and I absolutely loved it because I was able to focus on one of my key priority areas in healthcare, um, more specifically, um, health brokers, agents, and small business owners. And then I, I, I kind of got tired of that as well. <laughs> and I bounced around again. I went over to the uh, CSG Justice Center uh, where we focused on criminal justice reform issues. And I was there for about three and a half years and I absolutely loved it. And I found that criminal justice was one of my loves outside of tennis and outside of me going shopping and traveling and whatnot else. Um, and then I, wanted to come back to the Hill, I knew that um, the Hills where I thrived is what I loved and I was missing it. So I applied um, and I got hired on to come back to the Hill to work for Congressman Scott Taylor from Virginia. Um, and in that I learned that he was possibly the best boss I've ever had in my entire life, mainly because um, one of the things we made sure of was every bill we introduced. Oh, sorry, I was hired as his legislative director. Um, and one thing that he definitely pushed and I was in full agreement with them, every bill we introduced had to have a bipartisan component to it. And that means we had to have a Democrat original co-sponsor with every single bill we introduced. And I'm proud to say that we were able to do that for every bill except for one. And, and, and even that one bill did have a co-sponsor later on down the road that was a Democrat, just wasn't an original co-sponsor. Um, and I think what Congress is missing right now is a lot more of that. And then of course he lost, unfortunately. Um, and I went on to work for Congressman Greg Stubbe as his deputy chief of staff and legislative director. Um, I left there last July and I'm now at the Millennial Action Project as their vice president of programs, um, which has definitely been a blessing. Um, this organization is extremely aligned with who I am as a person in my theology um, and my own personal philosophy as to how we should be governing our nation um, and working with our legislators on both sides of the aisle and those who don't necessarily uh, um, believe that they are part of any of those categories. So I'm super excited where I'm at now and I'm super excited to be here today to talk to you guys about my journey um, and also to share some notes uh, with Keenan and also Tom about what their experiences have been as well. That's great. I mean, I love the fact that both of you had this uh, I don't want to say non-traditional path to the Hill, but you always hear about like what I did is I got an internship and I kind of 
was there nine years, slowly going up the ladder, but there are all these different paths that people can get to Congress and work on the Hill and go out and come back in. And, you know, and I just love that because it shows the, there's no one way. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let me ask you a question, both, you know, based off your experiences, what one piece of advice would you give to somebody uh, that wants to get their start on Capitol Hill? And remember, let's, let's, let's take it from somebody who's in college to somebody who's mid-career, you know, that full span, like what, what piece of advice was given to you that you, you would like to pass on to those folks? Keenan, you want to start? Sure. Um, the, the one piece of advice that I would give to um, young staffers who are trying to get on or, or even mid-career um, prof professionals is just get that mail.house.gov. What I mean by that is um, there are several members um, that we get excited about and they may get a lot of retweets and you may see them a lot on MSNBC or Fox. But, um, and everybody wants to work for them. But the easiest way to get the job that you are really at seeking on the Hill is to get that very first job. So when I sit down with uh, young professionals and even mid-career professionals who are trying, who have done something else like myself and transition into a role on Capitol Hill, it's just, just get the, the, the email address, just get the first job. And then that will allow you to uh, transition. The best piece of advice I was ever given prior to my start was by my very first Hill boss, Frederica Wilson. She told me, you know, look, Keenan, you're someone who likes to get things done and that's going to give you a problem in politics. <laughs> she funny. said, she, this was a dinner before we started on the Hill. She said, I want you to know that. But it gave me a patience for point of view um, when working with others. As Reginald mentioned, you have to work across the aisle. You have to work with people with different backgrounds and perspectives. And so um, I think what she was telling me was like, there might be people not like-minded and to, you know, um, open yourself to that. So those are two pieces of advice that I would give to anyone who's considering a career on the Hill. Absolutely. Um, and I, I'll agree with Keenan there. Um, I'll go a little step further. One of the things that were um, share with me about how to, you know, get involved and get there. And I really like that point you made, Keenan, about get that mail.house.gov. Because with that email address, it gives you so much access to different outlets outside the Hill, certain programming on the Hill. Um, and then also just the network of folks that you have with that email address. Um, the one thing I would share with individuals who are trying to get on the Hill, just make yourself as available as possible. Um, a lot of times individuals don't get the opportunity that I had with coming straight into a leadership office as an intern. Um, what some individuals, what you have to do is just sacrifice. And I hate to say that because um, right now, financially, times are not easy for everyone, but you have to sacrifice. I, I, I was lucky with not having to worry about sacrificing too much because I did receive a stipend. And when that was taken away, I was able to transition to another office for a full on salary. But do not hesitate when someone offers you an opportunity to get into their office, whether it's their campaign, whether it's doing phone banking for them, whether it's coming in and volunteering as an intern, doesn't matter what it is, take that opportunity and run with it. Um, I'm not saying you have to say yes to everything because you should have your own standards and beliefs and um, keep your integrity intact, but you have to be willing at a lot of times and not to just be able to get down into the weeds and just get dirty with everyone else and just have fun with the process and just go like head on and just do it. The second piece of advice I would give um, individuals, and this was shared to me by Emily Seidel, um, was to choose between politics and policy. And what they mean by that is um, on the Hill, you're not allowed to, and I think Kenan talk, touched on this, you're not allowed to um, do campaign work while you're on house premises, whether that's your district office or your office in DC. You're not allowed to do it and you're not allowed to do it on, on actual official time. But you do have opportunities to go off the Hill and help your, um, your, your boss out with doing certain campaign events and helping them develop policy that aligns with what the work he's doing currently or she's doing currently um, in their offices. But I would just say, make sure you pick which one you wanna go now. Me, I was a little bit more of a rebel. I chose to do whatever the heck I wanted to do. And I decided to dabble in both policy and politics. And I honestly, I did more of the, and surprisingly, I did more of the policy work 
off the hill than I did on the hill. Um, so I would say just definitely try to figure out which one of those two work out for you um, and just go with it and just have fun with it. That's great. And let me go a little bit out of order in the questions uh, that we had talked about talking about today. Um, can you talk about campaign work? Because you both had that back and forth between the two and as did I. And can you talk about how that brings value to Capitol Hill is, is working on a campaign and then coming back into the Hill? Kenny, you want to go first? Yeah, um, I absolutely think that campaign work brings a, a ton of value. As a chief of staff, it is my primary job, one, to take care of the member and take care of the staff. But my, the other background noise that I'm thinking about is how to get my member back to Washington. And so anyone who has that experience and approaches the job in that way, you know, you want to sign on to a bill, but does that bill make sense for these constituents? Um, there's, there's stakeholders um, that may or may not like certain policies for different reasons. And so a person who has been on a campaign tends to think like that. I also think campaigns expand your capacity to personally do work. Um, the, when Before I left the Hill to go work for Hillary Clinton, people would say to me, oh, we want to do a briefing. Let's do it a month from now. And then we would take time and plan the, the briefing. Mm -hmm. When I went on the Hillary race, I would get a call saying, Kenan, we have Eva Longoria on one part of the state. We need you to plan a rally for 5,000 people on this side of the state. And then Bill Clinton's going to come on a bus and you need to get a certain set of folks there. And, and I had a, roughly like 72 hours to do this on top of whatever I, else I had planned for that day. And so it stretched me, it grew me. And so I came back a much stronger professional. And the last thing I'll say on campaigns is that it helps you skip the line. So if you're on the Hill, you're gonna be staff assistant, then an LC, and then God, by God's grace, you're an LA and an LD. If you are on a campaign, when you come and you come with that experience and you built, you're in the car with that member, you're bonding with them. When I started with Frederica Wilson, I never worked on the Hill, but here I am senior advisor, right? Like right under the chief of staff because she and I spent 18 hours a day in the trenches for nine months. So I never had to be the staff assistant or the LC because we had that campaign experience. And I'm not saying that's everyone's story, but I'm certainly saying that campaigns have advantages. Great stuff, Reginald. Yeah, Keenan has made a great point. Um, when you're on a campaign for any congressional member, in that time, you are building a relationship with that member. And in building that relationship, you're also building up the trust that they have between each, between you have, between each other. Um, and like Keenan said, you have an easy in into that congressional office um, when you are volunteering and you are volunteering and it, and it shows um, to the member that you have a commitment to him and his vision or her vision. Um, so I would highly say, I would say when you get in there, you are able to build your own path from that point forward. Um, you can come in and say, hey, I've done this work for you on the campaign when it comes to canvassing or coming up with graphics. So I know I'll be really good on your communication side. Or I help you come uh, prep you for your debate with that with your opponent or against your opponent. And I gave you some policy points that you put on the website that you've been sharing on your handouts on the um, when you go out to do canvassing and, and things of that sort. So I would love to be on your legislative team, possibly your legislative director or your legislative assistant. Um, and then also, if you are running that campaign, which a lot of young individuals are, this is a direct and for you to skip the line completely and come in as the chief of staff. And I've seen that over and over again. And although it's not always the most beneficial to the member, the part that is the most beneficial is the fact that the member knows this person, trusts this person. And hopefully if you are a person who comes in in that role, you're able to adapt and build a team around you that isn't necessarily other campaign staff, but also individuals on the Hill that can lend itself to some of your weaknesses. Great advice. And let me, uh, let me talk about that too, because right now we're in a time where it's post-campaign and a lot of these folks worked on campaigns that didn't win. And so while the two of you gave examples, I think you can still take that experience because what happens on campaigns, and, and Keenan talked a little bit about this, is like you're underpaid and you're overworked and you take those skills and apply them to the Hill. Additionally, when you're on a campaign, you're going to get influxes of people coming from all over to help that campaign because it's an important one. So for example, when I was working for Nancy Pelosi, I was up in upstate New York in Buffalo on a special election and these two older guys walk in and I give them walk maps and, and, and they, and I knew that they were senior staff on Capitol and I helped them a little bit more. And 
the one older guy took a liking to me. Well, fast forward two years later, he became my chief of staff. Like, and I'm thank goodness that I was good to him and like prepped him well because then he was then my boss. So um, campaigns also bring together all the different kinds of people from the party and you get to know people and expand your network. And that gets to my next question is, is how important is networking when you try to get that first job or a job on Capitol Hill? Can you talk a little bit about that network? Um, Reginald, I'll start with you this time. Sure, um, and, I, and I, I knew this question was coming up, so I, I thought about it in a little more detail. And we've been answering a lot about individuals who are not necessarily on the Hill or are trying to get on, but I would suggest individuals who are already on the Hill, let's say staff assistants, interns. Um, sorry, my iron is telling me I need to turn it off. Um, <laughs> but for those individuals who are currently on the Hill, I would highly suggest all those free receptions that you get invited to, go to them. There are so many perks there. Number one, you learn who um, the other individuals from these trade associations are who are definitely pushing for certain legislation and who are directly meeting with your boss. Um, you could also show up to these events as a fa as the face of your organization, sorry, the face of your congressional office as well, um, and sharing the current priorities that your boss is working on that may align with this. So make sure you're prepared before you go to that reception to talk about some of the key legislation pieces that not only is this organization who's hosting the event wants to talk about, but also how does it align with your boss's key priorities? And then lastly, you're a congressional staffer and or an intern, and you're not probably getting paid the best. So like you said, on the campaign, you're working long hours with very little pay. You're going to be doing the exact same thing on the Hill. So take advantage of these free meals, free drinks, and whatnot. Because who knows? You may get opportunity to go on a staff deal trip to some foreign country, and it's absolutely one of the best opportunities you can ever have. Keenan? I, I would just offer that... Um... When you think about networking, we we think about introducing ourselves and building a relationship based on connecting with folks. I would I would add a layer to that that's really important on the Hill is your, your reputation. So whether you've uh, trying to come to the Hill and you're a person that is in my inbox because you want to grab coffee, or you're a staff assistant or LA and you're trying to become an LD the work that you're doing, these communications that you're having, you're building that reputation. And that is a strong piece of the networking because you're gonna have, you're gonna reach out to Tom. Tom is gonna look in, on LinkedIn and see who do we know, who does he know in common with you before he reaches back out? Well, if it's me, he's calling me and saying, well, Keenan, do you know so-and-so? And that's the real piece of networking that really advances people um, in DC. I've been the benefactor of people who've said positive things about me that I never knew were going to have to be my validators in a space. And so yeah, I would just encourage everyone treat every interaction um, as positively as you can. It, it can, DC, the nature of DC can lead itself to be transactional try to build authentic reasons to connect. And that's difficult when you're trying to get on the Hill, but show genuine interest in the role, show genuine interest in um, the Hill and, and try to make real connections. And then once you're on the Hill, every engagement you have, whether it's a, a constituent, Tom talked about being in a, a campaign office and not having a heads up that this person was, he knew was, they were senior, but didn't know like exactly where they were going. And so him being excellent in that moment allowed his trajectory to be awesome much later. And, and that sort of thing, that story plays itself both positively and negatively every single day. And so um, I would just say like, make sure that reputation is in, get, be responsive, be polite, be good up and down the food chain. Um, and those things will serve you in addition to you making those connections. Love it. Go ahead, Reginald. And I just want to add, and I'm not kissing up here, Keenan has an incredible record on the Hill. Her reputation definitely precedes her when it comes to working with her or any office she's associated with. And number two, I was going to say that um, definitely when you're in meetings with individuals, definitely, you know, you're going to, in this process of networking, you, there may be an opportunity for you to find someone who can possibly be a mentor of some sort in this process that can help guide you through that. And don't be afraid to ask for that sort of mentorship or that sort of help. Because by doing that, not only are you saying, hey, I have an interest in this, but you're also saying I have an interest in you, which unfortunately can stroke the individual's ego and make them even more excited to want to help you out or to participate in this process. 
great advice. And just keep in mind, everyone has been in your shoes from the chief of staff at the White House to the chief of staff at the speaker's office to us on this call. Like we've all been in your shoes trying to get that first gig or trying to get that next promotion or that next job. And it's a very, very pay it forward mentality in politics and policy in DC, regardless of party. And asking people for a 10 minute chat, let me pick your brain about how I get this next job. Uh, people are willing to do it. Now they're a little more likely to do it if you share a common connection with them. So ask yourself, what makes you you? So where's your home state? Uh, what college or university did you go to? And, and even though you went to University of Texas undergrad, you can ask somebody for coffee that got their master's there, or got their law degree, because you're still that same community. Fraternities and sororities, same thing. Um, <clears throat> ethnicities, like you, you, religions, you name it, that common connection can often lead to them helping you a little bit more. And when you make these connections, and to Reginald's point, whether it's on the Hill or to Keenan's point, whether it's before the Hill, and, and every single interaction, it's hard to do this, but try to keep track of it all. Like have a spreadsheet that you're keeping notes about the person you touch base with. If you can, if you could acquire their email, just shoot them a quick thank you on, on the end. Keep notes of that conversation. You know that they're what their favorite sports team was. You know what school they went to, so that you can shoot them an email to keep that relationship fresh at some point. Because then you will go back to those folks when you need their help, or, or you can, or you look for opportunities to interact with them again, and that'll help you continue on. And if, if you're good at keeping that list live and, and fresh, it's only going to help you network into your next job. Um, can you all talk about when someone who's looking to get a job on the Hill, um, what should they apply, what offices or internships should they apply to first? Keenan, as a former chief of staff, can you talk about hometown connections, home state connections, and whether those help? Yeah, and I, I, I would go back to your last, uh, uh, all the things you just said, Tom, about the connections, but I think those same rules apply to um, uh, your hometown connections and, and your advantages with an office. We seek to hire people from the district or if you're on the Senate side from the state um, because we, you have that local tie, you have a, a better understanding. But also some of the things that Tom mentioned that are not immediately in the line of sight, but like your sorority and your fraternity, my former boss is a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. And if you're a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, somehow you just magically float. <laughs> and he's like, oh, this looks like a good young man. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> so anyway, um, but think about those sorts of connections. Um, and if you're trying to tier um, where to spend your energy, I would say start off with your hometown member. This is, you didn't ask this question, but I'll just throw this bit of advice out there. When you are um, applying and you're going and you're thinking to spam it, think more on depth whether than breadth is my advice for candidates. Like you want to apply for many jobs, but every job needs to feel special. So if you're taking the time to apply to my office because you're from Virginia, and I, and it's a Virginia member, take the time to, in the cover letter, make me feel special, not me, Keenan, the office. Like, why do you wanna be in this specific role um, rather than taking one carbon copy of your application package and just sending it to every single member? It will distinguish you. So take those hometown ties and make it resonate um, connect the dot because we don't have a lot of time. So don't make me tease out why you are good for this office. Help me see that you drove down the highways and that you understand the rural and the urban uh, dynamics in my district and you could plug right in and be successful. And let me add one thing there is that even if you don't have a direct personal connection, you can say, I visited my aunt and uncle every summer in that district and I drove those highways and I know the, the problems they, and so you can, you can, and especially for those that are from a state that they don't have a lot of representation of the same political party that they have, you can still do make those ties other ways. Mm -hmm. Reginald, as a former legislative director and deputy chief of staff, what about you? What, what, what advice would you share? So I'm, I'm in full agreement with everything you and Keenan just said, um, but I'm one of the odd individuals who have never worked for anyone from my state. I'm originally from Texas. So I've worked for three members from Florida, one from Indiana um, and one from Virginia. So clearly nowhere near Texas. 
However, um, one thing I did in my gearing up to reach out to these offices, and it, and it may be a little uh, dishonest, but um, I went to Google and I researched the district and I looked up the different restaurants that they have in their district and I looked for the ones that aren't chains. So I can like pinpoint like, oh yeah, I've been to so-and-so. This is a great restaurant to go to. And I even went a step even further than that. And I looked at the menu and picked something on there that I knew and just, and like, oh yeah. And they served like the best chicken wings or they served the, the best funnel cake or whatever it may be. And I just like tried to add a personal touch to it, but I definitely made a point to finally get to that place in the district once I visited. So I can say I actually have been there, but you have to make, like you have to do something personal, uh, something that will say, okay, this person, yeah, they know the district or oh, they know about the dredging on our beach or, or they know about the issue with our, um, the residences and the drywall that's going on there. Anything that touches on a key issue in that district or that state, try to do your research beforehand. So it, so it seems as if when you're coming into it or when you're reaching out to them, you actually have some sort of vested interest in it. And clearly I have keen and tickled by my recommendation. <laughs> that but, is top number one creativity ever. You win, Reginald. You win, yeah, you, you win. win. But, but you just but have to show you have a level of commitment to this office and to that district and to the interests of the constituents. And honestly, that's one of the most simple ways you can do it. You're both right. And someone said something snarkily, but it's true. Members of Congress care about three things, re-election, re-election, and re-election. And what, that's what drives them. So of course they want a common connection to re-election and the hometown, the home state, you know, to get their constituents excited, they have people like them representing them in DC along with him or her, you know, as a, as a congressperson or a senator. Um, that's great, great, great advice. Um, can you guys explain the typical setup of congressional office in each of the positions um, located? Reginald, you wanna start? Sure. Um, so in a legislative office, normally you have um, interns, of course, and I wanna do this as if it's a totem pole, but there is a hierarchy to it. Um, you have your interns um, and then you have your staff assistant who tends to be the individual at the front desk, um, greeting individuals to come in, scheduling um, tours, uh, flags, uh, purchases for the constituents, um, pretty much monitoring and man uh, managing the interns. Um, and then you also have, uh, before I go to the legislative side, you also have the scheduler um, who does all the scheduling and tends to do more of the office management um, so that staff can have their payroll and things of that, everything, take care of healthcare, um, their, all the other benefits. And then of course you have the chief of staff who oversees the entire office. But on the legislative side, I'll let Kenan talk more about the chief of staff role because she actually was one, not me. Um, but on the legislative side, you have your legislative correspondent, which uh, pretty much in itself says what it does. They correspond with the constituents. Oh no. Is that me or you? I think that was you, don't worry about it. Keep on okay. going. So yeah, your legislative correspondent who responds to the constituents via um, an online portal most of the time, but, but also we have constituents who tend to like to send in mail as well. Um, so you respond to them with the congressman's or congresswoman's uh, point of view or policy piece or policy um, point on those key issues. And then above that, you have your legislative assistant who tends to handle more of the policy issues and the votes of every day. And they are given a set number of issues to focus on, whether it's healthcare, environmental issues or appropriations, they're handling that specific specific portfolio. And sometimes the legislative correspondent may have an issue to there. And a lot of times it's the postal issues uh, because they are handling the mail. <laughs> but then you have the legislative director who oversees the entire legislative portfolio for the congressperson um, and also manages those individuals on the legislative team to make sure that they are following um, the congressional members um, policy drive or their priorities for the year. And also they're the ones who are really running the machine in the legislative office to make sure that we're all staying on point and that the Congressman is aware of everything that may touch on his key priorities, his or her key priorities. And then also um, making sure that they're developing um, more legislative priorities for that member. And then Kenny, can you talk about chief of staff role and then additionally the district staff and how that operates? Yeah, definitely. And I, I'll just say quickly that um, on some of the alleged roles and even some of the like administrative roles, people, we've gotten a creative license lately on the Hill. So people may call themselves a senior policy advisor or like alleged aid or a health economics, something, something. And these are all really like um, legislative assistants or like uh, many schedulers now call themselves directors of operation, but they are still the person that's handling the scheduling function. So 
I meet with folks sometimes and they say, but I don't want to be a senior policy advisor. I'm like, just interview for LA. Okay. So now that we've gotten that business out of the way, chief of staff is accountable for all things related to the member. The, the, on the house side, we have um, 18 full-time staffers, four part-time staffers. We manage all those people. There's a roughly 1.3, depending where you live, uh, a budget of like 1.2 to $1.4 million. Tom and uh, Reginald are leadership people, so their budgets were much bigger, but I'm talking about rank and file members in a personal office. Um, that's roughly the budget we manage. And that's a big part of our job. We can't go over budget. We go over budget. Um, the member has to pay out of pocket. So that is, that is a, a bit of it. And then a, a lot of chiefs, not all chiefs, but uh, have political responsibilities. So Tom talked about members focusing on re-election, re-election, re-election. Um, in my free time as a chief of staff, I oversaw the, the campaign manager, the finance director, and any other uh, bit of our consulting team. And at different points, that's people who do your, your mail or people who handle robocalls, all of those the points of campaign apparatus. When the chief, anything that has the member's name on it, whether it's his spouse <laughs> or her spouse, the kids, um, the professional entity, as you think of it, Congress, and then campaign stuff is all um, the chief. Now, for the district office, you've got a district director who oversees the entire district operation. You have many caseworkers, or not many, but you have caseworkers who deal with um, when people need to have federal needs with the government, um, these people work through, I feel like they're crisis managers, really, and they're salt of the earth people who um, make our, our operation go. Um, in addition to that, you can have a, a different combinations of folks um, in the district, not beyond a district director and caseworker. I, would, I don't necessarily find the district offices are standard. For example, we had some outreach representatives, people who dealt with community engagement. I've been in offices that had um, a policy advisor or a communications director. And sometimes you have that in the district and sometimes you don't, but for sure, you're gonna have someone that tackles that casework and someone that um, leads the district team. And that's a, a, a huge component of services in the district, the member's reputation in, in the district, the member spends 75% of his time in Washington. And so that it, in a non-COVID year. Um, so it's really important that you've got a team that is responsive and engaged locally um, to keep up his, his or her politics. And that's your district staff. Go ahead, Reginald. We left off one position I completely forgot, but the communication side. Um, ah! and, and the <laughs> And the funny thing is, I feel so bad about it because as a former LD, comms individuals always feel as if we forget to include them in <laughs> conversation and in the process of getting bills to the floor and whatnot. But yes, there's a com communications director who oversees all communications for the member, including um, their TV time, radio time, filming, editing, um, any sort of branding that the member may have at the official level, they're doing that. A lot of times they're connected as well to the campaign and doing things involved in, in that realm as well. And then there's also press secretaries and press assistants who tend, or, and, or digital assistants who are doing more so of the things in the weeds, creating those graphics, um, thinking about how can we get the person on, the, on, on these TV shows, pitching them, um, pitching the legislation, so a lot of times they're going to come to the legislative staff and it's like, hey, give me a quick rundown as to what this may have to do with this topic that's going to come on Fox News or on MSNBC on Thursday. We want to make sure we pitch him for it so he can get on and or she can get on and talk about these issues. So you also got to think about that as well. Great explanations. And again, it, it all goes back to the point where these members of Congress care about re-election, but they want to use their power of their constituency, the power of their what they're doing in DC to, to communicate with their constituents of what they are doing for them or how they are representing them in Washington DC. And that's all the way from the legislative correspondence telling constituents back and forth in letters and emails what they're doing. It's the legislative assistants get, getting bills ready and, and co-sponsoring them. And then it's the legislative director to oversee them and the, and the chief of staff to oversee the whole operation and the communications folks to communicate it out. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think you guys did a great job. And, and just to keep in mind that while 
the three of us described a house office. Senate offices are just that on steroids, just expanded <laughs> larger because they represent an entire state, no matter how many uh, people are in that state. <clears throat> um, I, I promised we'd keep this kind of short, so I apologize we're running a little late, but a couple questions left. First of all, it's been, it's been well documented that the diversity on Capitol Hill in terms of staffers of color is, is terrible. Um, it's improved a little bit. I know that Keenan has been a part of organizations that have tried to improve that. And just from my personal experience, whether it's racial, ethnic backgrounds in terms of how people grew up or where they're from, a diverse decision group is always makes better decisions. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's so important for people of color to be better represented on Capitol Hill. And that's part of what we do at Tom Manitow's jobs is get as many jobs out there as possible, especially when more they're, they're more to Reginald's point of paid internships make a big difference in bringing a whole nother group of people their availability to, to the table at Capitol Hill. But Keenan and Reginald, let's start with Keenan. Can you talk a little bit about those resources that are available uh, for folks on the Hill? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, co-founded in 2018, the Black Women's Congressional Alliance. And it was to, to address these issues that Tom laid out. Look, we, the numbers um, were not good for senior staff of color. Um, at that time, no Black woman had been chief of staff to a Democratic United States Senator. Um, and that position affords you such a, an amazing career. Um, Black legislative directors, the numbers were, especially on, particularly on the Senate side, I want to, because they're, they're more on the House, but it's certainly not um, nowhere, we're, we're nowhere near the numbers we need to be. And so we started an organization to help people get the information that they needed because you know you need to know about the jobs you need to you need to have a somewhat of a competitive advantage and then um to provide a safe space uh people were um in offices uh, um, i don't want to say alone but it's, it's sort of if you're the only one like you sometimes it can be a bit lonely and and how do you identify with your coworkers? how do you fit in and and um Ascend, because I'll tell you guys these these house offices and senate offices too. Like it's it's small, and so on top of you doing a great job, you can't just do a great job and and make it. You've someone's got to like you to promote you, and you've got to be a part of the team. You've got to be a part of the culture, and so we started that that organization to help uh, folks do all of those things. There's several resources. There's a house diversity office. There's a senate diversity office. There's several affinity groups and staff associations that can embrace you. So ours is not the only one, but as a black woman, naturally that one, when creating that and, and, and pouring into that spoke to me, but there are several resources that you can tap into even before we take people who are interning to try to help you get on the Hill. So you can tap into these, these affinity groups long before you, um, or I, ideology groups long before you um, get to the Hill. And I'll say on that, and I'm glad you brought up the House um, Diversity Office, which is headed up by Kimba Hendricks, a good friend of mine, and also a fellow Howard Bison. Um, she has done a great job with focusing on getting individuals, both on the Republican and Democrat side, and also trying to find a counterpart on the Senate side for getting more people of color involved and getting more people in, of color on the Hill. Um, another individual that I would highlight is uh, Jennifer DeCasper. She's the chief of staff for, Con uh, for Senator Tim Scott. Um, she is a black woman who has um, really taken on the, the realms of getting more individuals of color um, and incident offices and congressional offices. So those are just two places that you can really go. But one other place, and I'm not sure, Ken I think Keenan, you were one of the members, if not on the executive board, but the CBA, the Congressional Black Associates, that organi organization specifically for uh, black staffers really uh, propels individuals with different sort of um, seminars on how to be a better staff how to take on different issues, how to uh, present yourself in a certain way that most offices tend to be attracted to and tend to post from. Um, but then again, when you think about someone like me who worked in the Republican offices, a lot of times, like you said, Keenan, you are the only one in there that looks like you. And it can be a little lonely and be a little tough. But I challenge anyone who is in that role to say, 
hey, I'm the only one that looks like me here. I'm the only one with my background here. So therefore I am the most valuable person to speak on certain issues um, in this role. So I would encourage anyone who may have had the same path as me or may be in the same position as me um, and just definitely speak up, be yourself and own that you are the only one there and just run with it. And when you get a chance, when you get to a certain position like I am, don't, don't forget those who were not as capable or as beneficial as you were and bring them into the fold with you. That's great advice. And that's, that's part of what we try to do here and, and, and preach also is that, you know, there are all these people that are helping you make sure you help people when they come to you just the same. Um, as we wrap up, let me ask you a couple, um, one, a couple like kind of quick fire questions um, that especially these days, I find interestingly enough that a lot of young people don't necessarily affiliate with a certain political party, especially the younger generations. And Reginald, I'll keep this to you because some of the work you do, do you have to pick one party or another or, or how, how, does it, how does that shake out these days? And I know that all of us on this call believe that um, more bi bipartisanship is, is only better for our country, but how does that shake out though? If, if someone has a couple of beliefs of one party but could see themselves the other, do they need to really pick a team when, when coming to Capitol Hill? Honestly, no, you don't. Um, when I first came on the Hill um, as an intern, I had this idea that I was a staunch conservative. I had to stand on certain different principles, otherwise I would not be accepted. And as I matriculated through my time on the Hill, I learned that I don't always agree with what my colleagues may believe or what the member that I work for believe, but it doesn't mean that I can't necessarily push the key areas where we do find alignment and really push that member to um, not necessarily change their mind, but also see the viewpoint from somewhere else, or see someone else's point of view. So I don't say you have to be aligned with that, um, but I will say it, ex ex it is extremely helpful when you do have that alignment with your boss to where you can talk about certain topics and you don't feel as if, well, if I say this, then I'm gonna be fired because it's not necessarily what the Congressman believes in and the Congresswoman believes in. So be mindful that you can't, you know, be a person uh, and come into an office and have something that's completely polar opposite and just say, hey, I don't think, I think you're completely wrong on this. And I, I, I can't work for you because of that, because you're not going to agree with your boss every single vote, every single piece of legislation or every single committee hearing. But you find ways to not only challenge yourself, but also challenge your boss to think differently. Challenge your boss to go a little deeper into the topic. Challenge your boss to be open to conversations about this that could possibly lend itself to a different uh, point of view for them in the future. Keenan, what about you? So I'm going to disagree with Reginald a little bit, but it's probably because I'm a raging Democrat. I don't know. So, all right, let's say you're getting your the job on the Hill and you start off in a Republican office and then you get your resume to me and I'm a Democrat, I am less likely to hire you, period. Um, I think you may be a plant um, <laughs> or I just, I'm not sure of your motives. However, there are some caveats to that. We've got a few, particularly, I'm gonna speak specifically as a Democrat to those that are helpful and then people on the other side of the aisle, you apply you use or not use what I'm saying as the gospel. In Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, we have one Democrat. So if you worked for a Republican, but you're from those states, I'm far more sensitive to your plight because there was no one else you could work for. Um, I mean, it was hard. Like if, you know, if Benny Thompson doesn't hire you and you're from Mississippi, then what are you going to do? So, um, Though in those instances, we work with staff um, and, and but you need to make that clear and probably you need to have someone call me and say, hey, this person is they've worked in a Republican office, but they're certainly a Democrat. And I think that depends based on the office. There may be offices that are more um, centered or to the center, uh, more bipartisan. But for for me, I, if you are um, trying to figure it out. I would try to at least, you know, there's going to be shades of red, shades of blue, but if you can, I would pick up, I would recommend picking a party and sort of sticking there. Cause once you sort of build up this reputation as, um, you know, D or R, you're, on, you're in that camp, at least for people like me. I don't know if they're, if I'm high in number, but that, that's my sort of take on that. Yeah, no, we, we love different opinions here. So totally appreciate both points of view. Reginald, do you have something else to say? 
Yeah, and, and I completely understand where Keenan's is coming from because if I was a chief of staff, and even as a legislative director, I've seen resumes come through um, with individuals who were not necessarily aligned politically with the member, but I would be even willing, to, I'll be even more interested to know, learn why you wanna come over here to this office. And so, although I may not hire you, I may give you an opportunity to have an interview so we can have a conversation. And who knows, during that conversation, I may learn that, hey, maybe you would be a benefit to our office. And maybe, like Kena said, you happen to be in the office that you just couldn't help being in in that moment. But also, like Kena said, the further you go along in your career with one party like me, there's no way for you to go over to the other side, like, hey, okay, I've seen the light and I wanna come and help you guys out or come to join you guys or teach me more. But you definitely, uh, I think there is some room, very little, but some room for you to join an office that doesn't necessarily align with your previous background. Great advice. Um, well, I need to let you guys go. Can you just give us one more tip? Um, so kind of summarizing everything you've said, like what's one thing you wanna leave folks uh, that are watching this and trying to get their, uh, their job on Capitol Hill? Keenan, I'll start with you for the final word. Yeah, for, for anybody trying to keep, a, a, to get on the Hill or you're either you're on the Hill and you're trying to move to a, a better job or a higher paying job on the Hill, um, do not get defeated, nothing's wrong with you. So, or <laughs> so I talk to people who frequently apply for many jobs and it takes a while, especially for that first job, it takes a, a little bit of time and it, it can be discouraging to, to get the rejections, especially when you're coming closer and closer to the final candidate, keep, keep going and also consider Hill adjacent jobs, jobs that interact with Congress but are not necessarily congressional until you can get there, get, get a lily pad, be there and then get back on the Hill. But you know, when you feel discouraged, take a walk, do the thing, do whatever it is that you, need to do to keep you in a good frame of mind because it is natural, normal, and expected that it's going to take some time for you to get that first job. So I would just say to all of you, hang in there. Great piece of advice. Reginald? Um, yeah, that was absolutely amazing, especially the piece about if you're not able to get a job on the Hill, don't be afraid to look for something that is Hill adjacent. Example, here at the Millennial Action Project, we have so many opportunities for individuals to come in and intern with us and work directly with our programs team and focus on whether it's state legislators or the federal legislator um, through our Congressional Future Caucus and our State Future Caucus Network. Um, but I'll take, I want to go a little bit further because I want to talk about something that's more specific to who I was as a Hill staffer. Um, if you do happen to get that job on the Hill or you're interviewing for that job on the Hill, um, don't lose yourself. Go into that office, be who you are authentically are because they hired you for that simple fact. My time on the Hill, and I'm being completely transparent and honest, the entire time I was not who I really was. And I had to learn each session that I was there. Okay, that's who I was this session. This is who I really am. How can I incorporate that into the work that I'm doing, the conversations I'm having, and this the, the energy that I'm putting out. So I would highly encourage individuals, be who you are, be authentic, because at the end of the day, your reward would be so much greater. Love it, love it. What a great way to end this. Well, Keenan and Reginald, thank you so much for your time. I can't, can't thank you enough. You guys are experts and gave some great pieces of advice. Uh, for those of you watching, um, there we have other resources about finding a job on in the administration, finding a job after campaign, check out the other videos, but thanks again for your time. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye, Reginald. Good to see y'all. Good to see you guys. Bye-bye.